Thank you very much. And uh, before I say anything else, I would like to, to highlight uh, the great work done by Charles Pink every day of the year in between these kinds of events and now for so many years along with Kim. Uh, thank you so much. And I would like to, uh, to highlight Victor Hugo, Major General Hugo, who has emceed this year after year after year uh, with such class and style. So a round of applause to, to that. Come on. And as I look through that video, it's a good thing that Tom Har Mark Harmon did not have to compete with Michael Vickers for the sexiest man of the year. <laughs> uh, despite what it said on the invitation, you've all figured out by now that I'm not the Secretary of Defense. Uh, he certainly regrets, as he said in his video, that he can't be here tonight. And I'm honored to, to fill in for him and personally hand in the William J. Donovan Award to, to Dr. Michael Vickers. I'd say that there's no place I would rather fill in for, them, for him uh, than here and now uh, with this ex extraordinary privilege, privilege that I've been handed uh, tonight and I'm honored to be among the many who have an opportunity to say a few words about Mike Vickers. Uh, certainly it's a, it's a distinguished crowd uh, that you've heard from already. Uh, you've seen the video, you've had the opportunity to read Mike's biography, uh, so I won't repeat his amazing chronology of professional and academic accomplishments. I didn't know him uh, for much of that time, but we all know uh, of the Sar Sergeant Vickers as the Special Forces Soldier of the Year, Captain Vickers helping lead all of us into uh, clandestine work uh, by United States military and Special Operations Forces, CIA operative Mike Vickers leading the largest operation in CIA history. Uh, he was a businessman, he was an, an academic. Uh, but I really got to know Mike uh, as we were nominated together uh, for our respective positions in 2003. Uh, me as the commander of the United States Special Operations Command and Mike as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity uh, Conflict. Uh, I know him as a, as a mentor, and we, and we went through our confirmation hearing together and took our positions at about the same time. Uh, my, I, I consider my opportunity to work with Mike and to be under Mike's oversight uh, during that period as the Commander of Special Operations Command uh, to be enormously valuable for me personally, enormously important. Uh, to the special operations community. I know him as a mentor, as a colleague, and a, as a friend. Uh, he was a partner uh, when it was right, and he was a firm, uh, he provided firm guidance uh, when that was right. Uh, Mike and I, uh, and I grew to appreciate his vast experience, his enormous talent, his fearless tenacity, and his quiet leadership. I saw him cl most closely in action when he was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict and later Special Operations, Low Intensity Conflict and Interdependent uh, Capabilities, a significant expansion of his portfolio uh, that did not cause him to take his eye off the Special Operations community. I saw him in the Pentagon, I saw him on Capitol Hill, I saw him with foreign counterparts, and I saw him with our own troops in the field around the world and there was never a moment uh, that I wasn't thankful to have Mike Vickers uh, oversee United States Special Operations uh, Command's operations and budget and to represent United States Special Operations Command inside the DC Beltway and outside and to have him as a personal sanity checker, counselor, and travel mate. Uh, Mike prefers unplugged microphones and life in the shadows, uh, but his words are always powerful and his presence is always meaningful. And my wife, Marilyn, and I have deeply valued our personal time with Mike and Milana. Uh, Mike's not the only highly educated, richly experienced, multilingual intelligence officer in the family. Uh, Milana has surprised us in almost every country that we visited together with her ability to speak that language. Uh, we haven't found one yet that, uh, that she can't speak. And when Defense Secretary Bob Gates realized that there are five Vickers' daughters, he noted that Mike was ideally suited to lead the Office of Low-Intensity Conflict. 
And I know that uh, many members of Mike's extended family here tonight, including all five girls. Would you all stand up? There's at least a dozen of you here tonight. As others have said, none of us would be here without them. Uh, and Milana took my wife, Marilyn, uh, to dinner in Rome on our Marilyn's and my 28th wedding anniversary uh, when Mike were in, and I were in Afghanistan. And, and Marilyn now puts that evening near the very top of her list of best anniversaries ever. <laughs> and so I thank you, Milana, and I will keep trying to reach your high standard. Uh, as Secretary Gates also said, events like this should end on the same day they begin. And although we're not at the risk of pushing up against the midnight hour, I do know that you'd rather hear uh, from Mike than from me. Uh, I'm tempted to use the PhD who can win a bar fight. In fact, Marilyn and I were saying we, we, we wanted to have a little drinking game going. Every time we heard Mike described as a PhD with a bar fight, we were going to take a sip of wine. We decided we couldn't do that. Um, you know, when the, OS, the OSS only existed about three and a half years, it only had one leader, Major General William J. Donovan. Uh, when it disbanded, there was really nothing to step into the void. And a few years later, uh, the CIA was created, and a few years after that, the Army created its special warfare capability, CIA to fill the intelligence void left by the dismantling of the OSS and the Army special warfare to fill the operational void left by the dismantling of the OSS. The two communities have grown up together for many, many years as brothers, but there are very few people who have had one foot planted in each of those two communities as firmly as Mike Vickers has, and who has had such an impact on both of those communities uh, to the extent that Mike Vickers had. As others have said, if you could computer design uh, uh, the perfect recipient of the William J. Donovan Award. It is, in my opinion, Dr. Michael J. Vickers. And it's with that that I, with great pleasure, introduce to the stage to receive the 2017 William J. Donovan Award, the Honorable Dr. Michael G. Vickers. Thank you, my friend, for that very generous tribute. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just in case some of you were wondering, no one ever mistook me for the sexiest man alive. <laughs> Tonight, I simply want to say thanks and to offer a few reflections on several Donovan Award recipients' impact on my life and on the enduring legacy of the OSS. Let me begin by thanking Charles Pitt and the OSS Society's Board of Directors for honoring me with the William J. Donovan Award. I am profoundly humbled to be included in the ranks of the distinguished men and women who have received it, and to receive it in the year that marks the 75th anniversary of the OSS's founding is a truly special honor. I am even more humbled to receive an award named after a man who more than anyone embodied distinguished service to the United States of America. As President Eisenhower observed, General Donovan set the standard for what it means to be an American hero. I want to thank our intelligence community leaders, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coates and Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence a Agency, Gina Haspel, for sharing the evening with us. We are fortunate to have their steady leadership during these challenging times. I also want to thank my friend Jim Clapper for his video tribute, and more importantly, for his path-breaking leadership of the intelligence community. Jim exemplifies distinguished service to the United States, and service, and service, and service. 
Jim planned to be with us tonight, but he had to have emergency surgery on Wednesday. Thankfully, he's, he's recovering nicely. I'd also like to recognize another friend and great IC leader, Stephanie O'Sullivan, who's with us here tonight. Secretary Mattis very much wished he could be here, but events in Northeast Asia determined that he be, or demanded that he be elsewhere. All I can say is you don't know who you're messing with, Rocket Man. Seriously, I want to thank my, the secretary and my friend and battle buddy of many years for his inspiring remarks. We all stand taller by his example, and it goes without saying how fortunate we are that he is our Secretary of Defense. I am very grateful that so many of my CIA special operations, IC, and DOD colleagues were able to share this evening with me. Thank you, and please forgive me for not acknowledging what each of you has meant to me over the years. I do want to recognize two special guests um, this evening, Bert Dunn and Claudette Abracados. Uh, Bert is here, and Claudette, I think, is over here. <laughs> Bert was the chief of Near East and South Asia Division when I was the program officer for the Afghan Covert Action Program. Bert exemplified what I thought a CIA clandestine service officer should be a Special Forces veteran, a Pashto speaker, repeated service in the most dangerous and hard places, an officer who was famous for running counter surveillance when he was a senior chief of station, a very, very good man and a great boss. Claudette's late husband, Gust, immortalized by the late uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman in Charlie Wilson's war, was chief of South Asia operations. Gust was a case officer's case officer with back alley street smarts and superb operational instincts. He was larger than life and the man most responsible for my success. As Lafayette says in the, in the musical Hamid, Hamilton, immigrants, they get the job done. And it was one hell of a job, defeating the Red Army and helping end the Cold War that Gus got done. Nothing I achieved would have been possible without Bert's and Gus's unwavering support. Bert and Claudette, thank you. National <laughs> National security is a team sport, and it took another three years after the Soviet leadership started looking for the exit before the Red Army completely withdrew from Afghanistan. Other CIA greats, Tom Twetton, Milt Bearden, Jack Devine, and Frank Anderson, among others, poured it on and kicked the Soviets in the rear end on their way out. I also need to recognize and thank my private sector colleagues for their very generous support in helping to sponsor this event. InQtel, Federal Data Systems, BAE Systems, Beacon Global Strategies, General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, SAP NS2, Lidos, Metis Solutions, and the Crumpton Group. My father, a Silver Star recipient in the B-17 strategic bombing campaign over Germany in the dark days of 1943, impressed upon me at a very young age the importance of family, and I have been truly blessed by mine. I want to thank the love of my life, Milana, my five darling daughters, Alexandra, Natasha, uh, Sophia, Oksana, and Kalina, my brother Rick, my in-laws, and hopefully a future in-law uh, sitting over there, most of whom who've traveled far and wide to be here this evening. Yeah. <laughs> Case officer habits die hard. What, what can I say? Thank you all for your love and support. It means everything to me. Several past Donovan Award recipients influenced my life and career in profound ways, and I'd like to take just a few moments to acknowledge how. Let me begin with the two award recipients with us here tonight, my fellow special operators, Admiral Eric Olson and General Norton Schwartz. Eric is the ultimate quiet professional, but boy, did his mother nail it when she gave him Thor as his middle name. A hero of the Battle of Mogadishu, 
Eric did everything one can do in naval special warfare, and then some. He is the wisest special operations commander I have ever known, and he was my right arm from 2007 to 2011. I benefited immensely from his counsel. Nordy inspired a generation of special operators with his daring airmanship as a key member of the Iran hostage rescue mission. I remember as a young special forces officer thinking how proud I was of our president and our special operators for undertaking such a bold rescue mission, and it inspired me to want to do similar deeds. A close collaborator of mine when I was an assistant secretary, Nordy transformed the Air Force into the one we'll need through the first half of the 21st century. Let me now turn back to my CIA days in the 1980s and touch briefly on Bill Casey, Bob Gates, President Reagan, and Prime Minister Thatcher. As Abigail Adams remarked about her own revolutionary generation, the 1980s were a remarkable time to be alive and to be serving in the CIA on the front lines of the Cold War. Director Casey, simply put, was a giant. As Bob Gates observed so well, Casey was Reagan's sword. He didn't come to CIA to manage it more effectively, to reform it, or to improve the quality of intelligence. Bill Casey came to wage war on the Soviet Union, and I was privileged to be a part of it. Bill Casey, in no small measure, won the Cold War. Secretary Gates has had the longest influence of anyone on my professional development, spanning the Cold War to today's wars, and I want to thank him for that video tribute. During the last half decade of the Cold War, when serving as Deputy Director for Intelligence, he was instrumental in providing analysis that gave our senior policymakers confidence that we could escalate and win in Afghanistan. And later, as Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, he was instrumental in overseeing the program to its successful conclusion. I remember when then DDI Gates was asked to certify in the fall of 1985 that we operators in Near East Division weren't about to start World War III with our big plans to dramatically expand our covert war against the Soviets. I told him several, uh, decades later how amazed I had been it is seeming unflappability when I briefed him on this NSC requirement and had him the papers to sign. At the time, however, I was very happy to take yes for an answer that he believed that we on the operational side had at least somewhat knew what we were doing and we were not likely to start World War III. As Secretary of Defense, he turned around the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and oversaw a major expansion of the war against Al Qaeda. He was my mentor in my transition to na national security policymaker and intelligence community leader, and I learned something important almost every day of the four plus years we were together in the Pentagon. He is, in my mind, America's greatest living statesman. My professional connection to President Reagan was admittedly far narrower, just centered around two very gutsy decisions he made in 1985 and 1986. The first, as you saw in the film, was his approval of National Security Decision Directive 166, which directed our government, with CIA in the lead, to go for victory in Afghanistan, to drive the Soviets out by all means available. I remember the goosebumps I felt working on the NSC-directed strategic review that led to NSDD 166, and when, to my delight, I received a signed copy that reflected much of what I had written and advocated for. It was one of those moments when you know history might be about to take a big turn. Now, I like that phrase, by all means available, so much that I've chosen it uh, as the title for my forthcoming memoir. <laughs> President Reagan's second big decision to deploy the Stinger anti-aircraft missile followed less than a year later. The Soviets had already been looking for the exit several months before the Stinger was actually deployed, but the tremendous success the Afghan resistance had in shooting down Soviet aircraft with it helped ensure that they didn't change their minds on the way out. My professional connection with Prime Minister Thatcher involved her decision in the summer of 1985 to authorize CIA to provide the British-made blowpipe surface-to-air missile to the Afghan resistance, several months before the U.S. was willing to introduce the Stinger. Now, unlike the Stinger, blowpipe is not a fire-and-forget weapon. It has to be radio-guided to its target 
um, through the use of a very small thumb manipulable joystick. More than three decades later, my right thumb still wants to do this when I think of Prime Minister Thatcher and Soviet helicopters. <laughs> now, it must be noted that the Afghan resistance had far less success with the hard-to-master blowpipe than it did with the Stinger, but the blowpipe still resulted in about a dozen kills, and it had an even larger deterrent effect on Soviet air operations. And it was a very gutsy decision by Prime Minister Thatcher to let us deploy it. Let me now say a word about my two bin Laden battle buddies, Director Panetta and Admiral McRaven. I didn't know Director Panetta before he came to CIA, but I quickly came to admire his leadership style, the devotion he uh, inspired among CIA officers during a politically difficult time in the agency's history, his strong advocacy for the bin Laden raid, his political acumen, and his vision about what it means to be an American. It is hard to imagine anyone could take the Joint Special Operations Command to a higher level than Stan McChrystal, but that's exactly what Bill McRaven did. Bill was a fantastic partner of mine as NATO Soft Commander, JSOC Commander, and SOCOM Commander, and I want to thank him for his video tribute. During one of my visits to Ankara about 10 years ago, Turkey's top general mentioned to me Admiral McRaven had just been here, and he said that his confidence in Turkish Special Forces was so high that he held the target for us during our live fire close quarter battle drills. So I thought, if Bill did it, I should too. So, you know, there I was. You know, it, it, sound, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. <laughs> Bill, of course, was absolutely critical to the success of the bin Laden raid, and several other officers who are with us here tonight also played key roles in taking down bin Laden, but some remain undercover and can't be acknowledged publicly. We should thank them all, however. <laughs> Let me end my tribute to Bill with this. If there's an Eisenhower to be found among our recent generation of senior military commanders, and our country could use an Eisenhower uh, about now, my bet would be on Bill. I'd like to conclude by making a few observations about the enduring legacy of the OSS. The spirit of the OSS lives on in CIA and our special operations forces. Only in CIA could I have been allowed to do what I did in the Afghan Covert Action Program. Only in our Special Operations Forces could I have been trained and developed as I was and given the early command responsibility that I was given. And as our com campaigns since 9-11 show, that tradition is as strong as ever. It is the OSS's successor organization, the, C organizations, the CIA and our Special Operations Forces, that have been our primary strategic instrument since the 1980s. CIA fought the decisive battle of a Cold War in Afghanistan. After our, the 9-11 attacks, our nation turned to CIA officers like Hank Crumpton and Phil Riley, who are both with, with us tonight, and to special operators like John Mulholland to lead the fight against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. In the decade and a half since, CIA and SOF have continued their pursuit of Al-Qaeda, its allies, and its offshoots, and they will continue it until those groups are defeated for good. Whatever challenges we confront going forward, from Russian covert action to North Korea's expanding nuclear arsenal, I am confident that CIA and SOF will continue to lead the charge. Intelligence and special operations have never been more important to American national security. Like the OSS, CIA and our special operators go where others cannot go, and they do what others cannot do. When presidents turn to CIA to try to achieve through covert action what can't be achieved in any other way, or when we dramatically expand the use of our special operations, we say that CIA has never looked more like the OSS, or the OSS is back. Well, in my judgment, the OSS should never have left. Covert action is a core mission of CIA. 
Finally, the integration of special operations and intelligence, and indeed the partnership between DOD and CIA, is closer than ever. We are a government's eyes and ears and its principal action arms. We combine capabilities seamlessly to conduct operations, and we develop many of our most jo important capabilities jointly. The OSS spearhead continues to point the way forward. General Donovan would be extraordinarily pleased with the enduring contribution he continues to make to the security of our great nation three quarters of a century after the founding of the OSS. I have been truly blessed the past four decades. I was given the opportunity to do what I love, special operations, covert action, intelligence, and then later national security strategy and policy. My only regret is that I wish I could do it all over again. Thank you, may God bless you all, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you.